if the crucifixion is dealing with that first thing that really sent us into this uh, this path, right, uh, the fall itself, then certainly it has something to do with the knowledge of good and evil. It must, right? G'day everyone, Dave Dean here, and I'm really excited to share with you a fascinating conversation that I've just had with an excellent scholar, Dr. Nathan French, exploring the meaning and significance of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil mentioned in the Eden narrative of the book of Genesis. Dr. French has studied at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Jerusalem, Israel, and completed his PhD at the University of Aberdeen in the UK in Hebrew Bible and the Ancient Near East. And in today's conversation, we'll be taking a look at his PhD dissertation topic, which is titled A Theocentric Interpretation of Hadar Tovera, which translates into English from the Hebrew as A Theocentric Interpretation of the Tree of the Knowledge of Good and Evil or Good and Bad. Now, this is one of those topics that I think most of us would have at least heard about and been central to the origin of the Christian story. It's obviously instrumental in setting up the broader redemptive story that climaxes in the coming of Jesus. But if you're anything like me, this tree has always been something of an enigma. What is this tree? What does it really mean? What does it represent? Well, today we'll be taking a deep dive into these kinds of questions, exploring how people have understood this tree throughout history and the ways knowledge of good and evil are spoken about throughout the Hebrew Old Testament, leading to Nathan's scholarly contribution to the conversation. And I, for one, have found my own theology corrected and enriched by Nathan's research. But whether you're a skeptic of the Christian faith, new to the faith, or have been a believer for years, I think there is something in this conversation for all of us, which spans from the deep, deep, deep recesses of antiquity right through to the modern day. Uh, Dr. Nathan French, it is great to have you. Uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation for some time. Uh, We're going to be here today talking to you about your PhD research, which is on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yes. Well, thank you, David, for having me. It's a blessing to be on uh, this podcast and uh, good morning to you in the future. So <laughs> absolutely in the past. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this this research that you've done on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is that the the title? Um, looking at your 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 book that you've you've published, which is from your PhD, there is some uh, different symbols in the in the the label there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I put the I put the Hebrew uh, right into the title uh, actually. So. Uh, yeah, so the title of my PhD, both the dissertation and the published version, I, I, I stuck with the title is a theocentric interpretation of Hada'at Tovera, uh, the knowledge of good and evil as the knowledge of uh, for administ- uh, administering reward and punishment, and of course Hada'at Tovera in Hebrew is the knowledge of good and evil. That's uh, that's how you would say it in Hebrew, uh, and so that is the title again. A theocentric interpretation of Hada'at Tovera, the knowledge of good and evil as the knowledge for administering reward and punishment. Okay, that is quite the title, and it's quite the title. Uh, yes, <laughs> I, I do know one who uh, Daniel Defoe. He beats you though, uh, Robinson Crusoe. That is like the abstract <laughs> to his entire book. Yes. It's just a paragraph. So. That's good. I uh, like that. Couple of couple of sentences to go there, but um, okay. So a theocentric interpretation. Now, Tove Ra, that um, the Tov there is good and Ra is evil. Is that correct? That, that is correct. So Hada'a Tove Ra. The knowledge of good, tov, ve, ra, and evil, ra being evil. Uh, of course, this is taken right from the phrase in Genesis 2 9, uh, where you have ve'etzachayim betokagan, you have the tree of life is in the midst of, in the midst of the garden, uh, and ve'etzada uh, tov, um, so, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But, of course, when you get into the literature talking about uh, the knowledge of good and evil, it, they just call it Hada Tovera. Hada <laughs> Tovera. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, on that point, like when we open up our Bibles, right, to the Eden narrative, it's right there in the first couple of chapters of Genesis. Uh, there's a lot of trees. Um, good for food, pleasing to the eye, um, mm-hmm. perhaps not the best for covering nakedness, as we find out in Chapter 3. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So despite yeah. all of that, you know, the, the author, though, clearly is drawing our attention to two particular trees in the midst yeah. or in, in the middle of the garden. And as you said there in Genesis 2, chapter 9, we yeah. read about those two trees, the tree of life and the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. What yeah. was it about that second 
tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, yeah. that got your attention enough to spend years getting the <laughs> highest degree, you, degree we can obtain at university, yeah. uh, PhD. Uh, well, I ate the fruit and I was hooked, I guess, in the end. No, I. Uh, what happened was I was a student at the Hebrew University doing my graduate work. Uh, in Jerusalem, and there was a course I was taking on Genesis 1 through 11, and for a midterm paper, we had to write uh, something between Genesis 1 and 6, and I thought, uh, I was overloaded with languages at the time and all sorts of things I was studying uh, in addition to that course, and I thought, well, I, I could pick one of the two trees, because there's a lot written on it, so surely there's plenty of information, lots of research, this will be a, a good topic, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil stood out to me uh, for really the simple reason of knowing that the tree of life is all over the ancient Near East as a motif. So the tree of life uh, sort of representing eternal life uh, in general, but 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 other things as well beyond that, but really eternal life essentially. Uh, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a motif that I know is is was was non-existent uh, in the ancient Near East more broadly. And um, I in any case, was curious, what is this tree of the knowledge of good and evil? I never stopped to actually uh, think about the question more deeply. Uh, and so I thought, well, let's give it a go for this midterm paper. So I did. And when I jumped right into the commentaries, uh, I was just fascinated by the discussion and all the various interpretations that existed. Uh, uh, and um, seeing that there really wasn't a unified interpretation. So scholars know, they, they'll say the tree of life is sort of represents eternal life. That's, that's most likely what it means in the story. But the truth of knowledge of good and evil, we don't, we don't know. It's an enigma. It's, uh, mm. uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a mystery. So anyways, I thought, well, this would be a great paper. So I did the paper, um, got into the research, and what I found in the research was I couldn't find just one study I could go to to really unpack this. I had to go through commentaries and journal articles, and it just seemed that the rabbit trail just kept on going, of course, because it's been reinterpreted again and again uh, for a very long time, I should say, this motif. So uh, anyways, uh, after that uh, time, my time at uh, the Hebrew University, I thought, this would make for a good PhD project if somebody would be willing to uh, to supervise it and, and take that challenge on. And I uh, I found that someone in 2014 at the University of Aberdeen, uh, Professor Lena Sovia Tiemeyer, who is now actually teaching uh, in Sweden. Uh, she's professor at uh, Uremberg School of Theology uh, uh, there. So anyway, she was at Aberdeen. Uh, I had written to her and she thought it would be a fun study to uh uh, to to go with so that's that's how I ended up doing it uh, and writing it uh, in the first place so it really became uh, something that I thought well you know this would be this would be good I think for the academy in general for the discussion since there wasn't just one work you could go to on it so mm. well I, certainly from my perspective um, uh, having written a, a paper at my during my the course of my MA and then circling mm. back to that. Um, question earlier this year thanks to bible study we're going through the book of genesis uh -huh. and then some questions that i received um you know on the podcast uh, from the radio program that i'm, I'm involved with um around this and then that that dove me back to some of the papers that i would written and, and i gotta ask as you well when i reflected back on the paper that i wrote at my ma level i, I cringe <laughs> uh, for you, having now moved on and done a phd how close was your ma work or your um yeah your your paper that was originally written to where you kind of landed it after years yeah. and years of research. That's a that's a very good question. So it's uh, light years away from it for sure, right? <laughs> I mean, it's the distance is 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 long, but I think um, ultimately the main premise. Uh, the interesting thing was uh, in that paper that I wrote at the Hebrew University. I I at when I first jumped into it, I was simultaneously reading Second Samuel in my devotional time and. <laughs> What was interesting was good and evil, I noticed, was all over the place in Hebrew in the Second Samuel narrative. And um, it was it was that particular narrative that sort of led me to this idea, well, what if what if this is the knowledge of good and evil? And has anybody sort of made that connection? And as I got into the commentaries, what I found really fascinating is that Second Samuel, the very narrative I was reading, the David story, the throne succession narrative, became uh, or was very central to all the other interpretations. And so I realized I'd already made a connection there, but I noticed that the way that good and evil is functioning there, which I know we'll talk about here in a moment, so I don't want to go into it 
but I noticed that the way that it was functioning there um, was sort of a perfect way of sort of making the argument. So I will say this, the argument sort of remained in my PhD. I definitely took mm -hmm. from what I was doing at the Hebrew University and, and, and did it. But the thing that needed to happen to make the argument is what happened in the PhD, certainly not in the paper that I wrote, uh, wrote back then. So, right, right. Uh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Now, so look, many I, gotta ask. It, it, I mean, that's, that's the difference between graduate and postgraduate. You write, you write papers, yeah. graduate, and, uh, well, by the time you get through the PhD level, you, yeah, you're right. You kind of cringe at the things you wrote in the past. So, <laughs> <laughs> and the PhD, PhD level, you're, you're filling the gap that, uh, that didn't exist. Whereas the, I guess the MA, you're really trying to collate what the scraps you can find. And, yes. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what I, what I was really trying to do, I think in that paper at the MA level was, uh, write a PhD, which is not what you do at the MA level. Right. Oh. So, uh, yeah. So. Um, you're speaking. It, you're speaking my language. This is my problem with my studies: is always getting dispensations for going too long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> indeed. So yeah, so that's how I came across it, and I, I I sort of held that through the years. I had some other ideas I wanted to work on, maybe in a PhD, but I thought, well, this would work if if given the opportunity and uh, under the right supervision. Could not have done it without uh, Professor Lena Sophia Tiemeyer and her guidance in it. Uh, she's a brilliant mm -hmm. writer, brilliant scholar, and um, was very helpful in it. So, now look, I've got to ask: uh, when it comes to the forbidden fruit, are we talking about apples or oranges? <laughs> figs. I think we're talking about figs, figs. right? Right. The fig leaves right. there. Yeah. So, of course, with the apple. Uh, the word in Latin for apple is sounds very similar to the word that means evil in Latin, and that's where the apple idea sort of comes from, from in the history of interpretation. Uh, but uh, the fruit is never mentioned, you know, the, the type of tree or the type of fruit that is eaten is never mentioned. But because they cover themselves with fig leaves, there is, of course, the tradition that it was a fig tree, and figs are very popular, obviously, in the land of Israel and in the Middle East more broadly. So, yeah. Yeah, that, well, we won't go there now, but you could run that whole fig trail right through to Jesus cursing of the fig tree and what to say there. Yeah, 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 um, interesting. Yeah, and uh, I was also thinking what the the Hebrew word for tree is eight. Is that correct? Yeah, ets, ets, ets. Yeah, ets. okay. So can't help but notice how close that is to ents in uh, in talking. So I don't oh, know yeah, if there's a, you know, the, the walking, talking trees. I don't know if there's, knowing him, there's probably definitely a connection there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, talking. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, look, just a final question before we dive into the nuts and bolts of your particular findings in your PhD. Mm -hmm. I guess from my end, uh, as I engage with people's questions about the Christian faith, um, there are many that, that come straight out of Genesis chapters 1 through 3, the, the creation narrative, the Edenic narrative. Uh, you know, for example, if God created the world and it was all good, why did he put this evil tree smack yeah. in the middle to tempt us? Yeah. It's like God's put this big red button, then a sign next to it that says, you know, do not press. What would you say to, I guess, a question like that? And and more generally, what are some of the other misconceptions uh, that you've encountered when it comes to what the Bible has to say about these trees in the garden, in the midst of the garden? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, maybe I'll start with the misconceptions, actually, because I, 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 I think that'll lead into the, the, the first question that you asked here. So I think one of the misconceptions that we can take away from reading the Eden narrative, and you find this in different interpretations, you can hear it sometimes in the sermons, and that is that the trees are irrelevant to the story, mm -hmm. uh, that, that really it's about something else altogether, and I actually think from the ancient writer's perspective, that would just be a mistake because the trees are at the very forefront uh, of, the, of the narrative. And though the tree of the knowledge of good and evil appears right in the middle, uh, the tree of life comes forth again at the end. And so mm -hmm. you see that the whole narrative really is surrounding these uh, two trees uh, in general, one tree that says something to do with knowledge and another tree that has something to do with life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a second misconception would be that the trees have nothing to do with God himself. Of course, he put the trees there, right? In the, in the logic of the narrative, uh, the divine character is the one who puts, obviously, the trees in the midst of the garden um, as he is the uh, creator. You do, uh, 
you do get this sometimes in the interpretations that there is a, um, I don't know, uh, uh, a sort of uh, leaving that to the side. And I actually think it's quite important uh, for the whole narrative. And that sort of leads, I think, into your first question. Why would God put this tree in the garden if he didn't want them uh, to eat from it? In the ancient uh, stories, uh, more generally in the ancient Near East, of course, we have, for example, the Adapa myth, or we have uh, the story of Gilgamesh uh, and, uh, uh, and others as well that deal deeply with knowledge and life. Why is it that humans can have knowledge and wisdom, but why can't they have eternal life? And so mm-hmm. essentially what we're dealing with at that point is divine knowledge and divine life, because wisdom was thought to be something that came from the gods themselves, right, on an ancient Near Eastern level more generally. But here in our Genesis 2 and 3 narrative, it's obvious that divine knowledge and divine life are placed there by God himself within the narrative. So now why would God forbid eating of uh, the tree of the knowledge of good evil? Well, that's the question, right? That Mm. really is Mm. the question uh, that is so tempting to want to ask and to try to uh, understand. And I I will say this, I think, from the outset, that if you're reading Genesis 2 and 3, especially once you get into Genesis 2, we have uh, this human um man that is uh, created and he is of course in the image of god created in the likeness of god uh mm-hmm. those those words for image and likeness in hebrew have um uh meanings in other ancient near eastern texts in and around israel i don't want to get mm-hmm. too technical here uh but essentially the image of god refers to uh the um the statue of god the statue of the gods that uh, would have been placed in temples in and around the ancient Near East. And in those temples, those statues were thought to go through an animation process in which which they uh, the presence of the deity then sort of dwelt uh, within uh, those statues. And um, that sort of imagery, pardon the pun, that sort of motif is precisely what's happening there, uh, I think, in Genesis 2 and 3. There's a great scholar out there, Dr. Catherine McDowell. She's written extensively on this, some great work she's done on YouTube that you can see in her lectures on this. Um, and um, and others others have written on this as well. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's quite interesting. Anyways, long story short there, if the humans are essentially these uh, these images, these uh, children of God in one sense, because that was true of the image um, of, of the king and others in the ancient Near East, but also those who are the representation of God in the earth, well, they need to have divine knowledge and they need to have divine life. That would go mm-hmm. right along with being that sort of um, that sort of vocational, right along with that sort of vocational call. So, um, all that to say, it seems that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a test. It's a test to see if the humans will indeed obey before they can receive divine knowledge. If they disobey, we see what happens in the rest of the narrative. But if they obey the other side of the story, it seems in the logic of the narrative uh, that they would have probably been able to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, receive divine wisdom, and then mm-hmm. receive divine life as well, becoming God's fully animated images in the earth, manifesting his presence to all of the cosmos with divine wisdom and with divine life. Of course, wow. the Eden narrative tells us a whole different story in the end, doesn't yeah. it? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that that's, that yeah. is, uh, yeah, I, I think that's the best way to understand the narrative in my reading of it and all my study of it is that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents a divine test for good reason, which we'll get into, uh, but ultimately um, they they would have been allowed to eat of it if they would have just obeyed. So I mean, You've just skimmed the surface of a lot, but I guess what you're showing very briefly is that caricatures of the Edenic narrative, whether that's from a, you know, theologian scholar as um, a bigger heavyweight as a Ricky Gervais, <laughs> um, when he gets up there and he, and he does like a comedy skit or something, just tearing into the, the narrative, you know, 
it may make for a cheap laugh, but it, it really doesn't at all consider, I guess, the, the substance of this millennia old text that we really need to get into the historical, yeah. linguistic, yeah. Uh, grammatical kind of context. And then even then, you know, um, it's still a work in progress. But um, yeah, and no, I appreciate that. And, and something else that you, you kind of hinted at there is the idea that perhaps we were, you know, always destined to eat from that tree is that yeah. um, I guess the misconception to the whole idea of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil being this big, bad red button, do not press uh, this evil thing in the middle. It's it's not actually called an evil tree. It's called the tree of the knowledge of good Correct. and evil or, or, yeah. or bad, as I understand. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And we'll, yeah, we'll get into that. I think that's good to put that out here before we get into the rest of this is to put that mm. idea out there that what if the tree itself or the knowledge itself is not, bad or evil in and of itself. Like you said, it is a da tov veira, mm -hmm. where I think one of the misconceptions is that a lot of people just hear it is the evil tree, for example. Yes. Uh, but it's not. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil slash bad. And uh, yeah. and we'll get into that. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into it then. So, um, yeah. when, when I open up your, your work, the thing that I so appreciated is, I guess, what you were struggling to find in your own research, and that is um, some of the, the different views or a catalog of the different views out there you've you've mined the hundreds and thousands of pages of literature to collate <laughs> them all together to give us i guess a, a, a survey or a classification of these kind of different interpretations of the phrase uh the knowledge of good and evil so could you just perhaps walk us through um there's nine of them in total but maybe just some of the the main ones sure. that you came across and the more interesting ones yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the one of the first interpretations that, it, and I really covered the critical scholarship from the 1850s forward, um, uh -huh. and didn't deal with any more of the more uh, of the ancient interpretations. Though I do have them in footnotes every now and then of of, of different thinkers throughout uh, history that have that have come to this the table of this discussion. So um, distinguishing the beneficial and the harmful is one of the first ones. So to be mm -hmm. able to distinguish between what is good and what is bad, that is one of the first interpretations of, uh, of the knowledge of good and evil, but that was dismissed quite quickly by the critical scholars. They, they, they did not see how this could be uh, the interpretation within the story. Moral discrimination, which is similar to that, except instead of between what is good and what is harmful, because Tov and Ra can, could, could mean that in, its, uh, in a very basic sense in Hebrew, uh, we have what is good and what is evil in a moral sense, right? So we have m moral discrimination, being able to discriminate that. Uh, wisdom, that uh, what the humans receive as a type of wisdom from the tree is probably one of the most uh, widely agreed upon and held interpretations within critical scholarship. Uh, the problem with it is, what do you mean by wisdom, mm. ultimately, all right? And within the discussion of wisdom, it's, it is quite uh, varied. Uh, there's, there's quite a, um, there, there's really no consensus within that one interpretation of what wisdom means. So, for example, you have Proverbs that says, get wisdom, get understanding, right? It seems that to have wisdom is the goal. Why is it forbidden if it is an interpretation of wisdom? So, uh, that's one interpretation. We'll get into that here as we move forward, I know. I actually fall on this one. I think it is wisdom, but I define wisdom in a very, very, very uh, particular and nuanced way. Um, cultural knowledge, this one's fun. So, uh, the idea being that after they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they put on clothes, right? Mm -hmm. And so that is uh, sort of this indication that humans now have the ability to build culture. Uh, we have that uh, in as we move forward in the Genesis chapters all the way up to Genesis chapter uh, 11 with the building of the Tower of Babel. Uh, we have weapons. We have cities. So the idea being that out of the knowledge of good and evil – comes civilization, comes culture. Uh, that was one of the uh, one of the held interpretations um, by even Julius Wellhausen, uh, the uh, the great German uh, Hebrew Bible scholar. Uh, he would have he would have held to that sexual knowledge. This is a good one. So this is uh, held by this is the most widely held, I think, Jewish interpretation, especially the ancient Jewish interpretation, but even in a modern perspective, uh, that uh, Hadad Tovera. Is simply a greater uh, a greater metaphor for the act of sex itself, uh, and believe and 
It, what's really interesting about that is uh, the motifs in Genesis 2 and 3 work quite well for this. So, for example, uh, once we get to Genesis, uh, the end of Genesis 3, beginning into Genesis 4, Adam knows his wife and she bears a son, right? Uh, and, of course, the root in Hebrew for that is yada. It's the same root that would be for knowledge. So we have it in our English translations to know his wife. Yada is the same root for knowledge that we have in the tree. Hada'at. Yada, hada'at. It's, uh, it's the same root. And so there are connections there. Also, um, connections between trees and fruit in the ancient Near East and um, sexuality as well. Um, I believe it was the late Jacob Milgram who really uh, was, a, was a, a big proponent of this particular interpretation. And he really focused more on progeny, that you could bring good and evil into the world through progeny, essentially through mm. the bearing of children. Of course, with this, the great uh, – well, we'll get, into, we'll get into another question on that. Uh, we have uh, maturity. Some think it's maturity. And then magic. Magic is one that is widely held as well. The problem with magic is how do you define it? Uh, the The – Better, I think, definition of magic in the ancient Near East is more likely um, how is it that you can do something or attain knowledge in order to get the gods to do something. Uh, mm. And so uh, I suppose if you were going towards divination, which which some do, um, they tend to, to, to fall into that interpretation. Uh, and it, and it, it has some interesting parallels in the Eden narrative nonetheless. I think in the history of research, what I'd like to say on that is that uh, it's it's a fun um, discussion to go through. So this is mm -hmm. sort of the, the second chapter. It is the second chapter of my book. And my idea behind it is to get my reader going into the discussion of the critical interpreters and how they have tried to understand and interpret Hadad Dovei Ra uh, and see all the wonderful connections that are being made by the scholars with other texts of the Hebrew Bible and interpretation so but th those are those are a few of them again wisdom uh sexual knowledge and magic are probably the most widely held along with omniscience so yeah yeah and and omniscience um the idea of you know the, the knowledge of good and evil just being everything so would would you say like a mirrorism would you say that a, a phrase Correct. like the good, the bad, and the ugly, so just everything, right? Everything, it, yeah, like that, that or, or yeah. everything between heaven and earth, right? You know, so yeah, it's it's gotcha. a, it's a mir it's a mirismus. You put the words together, tovera, everything in between, and uh, mm -hmm. and that is the knowledge that they receive. Uh, mm -hmm. One one issue yeah. again, or one one argument against that in the critical commentators that the humans don't seem to be omniscient at all after they after they partake mm -hmm. of that uh, mm -hmm. So. Um, so very interesting. <laughs> yeah, much to say there. And I think the thing I appreciated out of that was everyone seems to, well, all of those different views, there's elements in all of them, really, but trying to hold, I guess, one up as the definitive answer. It, it, it has some elements, but doesn't consider other factors. And anyway, we'll yeah. move through, uh, I guess, some of the ways that, that you brought different elements of those together. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, coming then to, to your critical, yep. uh, your contribution to, and to, to my own scholarly, interpretation yeah yeah conversation uh, i guess having read through through your work the thing that that i so appreciated was the way you set it up um the methodology the way you um defined parameters that need to hold true for any particular interpretation of yeah. this tree of the knowledge of good and evil could you just walk us through those i think sure. it will be really a, a bit of a key as we unpack yeah. what you came to find in your own research yeah well, and part of my methodology um, is is twofold. One, I want to ground it in the history of research. So I, I want it to be part of the discussion with the interpreters themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And then bring in the parameters like you're saying. Because to me, everyone is sort of arguing back and forth about what the best interpretation could be and why. So I set out for my own methodology to say, okay, we need three parameters, the first parameter is that any interpretation must show that this truly is divine knowledge uh, in the narrative. Uh, because within Genesis 2 and 3, the narrative assumes that this is a tree of divine knowledge. And what I mean by that is in Genesis 3.22, uh, 
after the humans have partaken and eaten of the tree, after the curses have been laid down by the Lord himself, he says to his divine counsel, behold, the humanity has become like one of us, knowing good and bad slash evil. So very interestingly, the narrative tells us that the Lord himself possesses this knowledge. He has Hedat It is his knowledge. And the divine beings and or the heavenly beings, however you want to interpret that or uh, translate that, uh, they too have the divine knowledge itself, right? Let us make uh, humanity, and in this case, behold, humanity has become like one of us. Um, to whomever the uh, uh, us is referring. So, the first parameter is it must be divine knowledge. So, for example, if your interpretation is that Hadat Ra is just a greater metaphor for, let's say, maturity, how is that divine knowledge? Why is that understood as divine knowledge? How about sexual knowledge? So, this is one of the interpretations against sexual knowledge, is that the Lord himself in Scripture is not a sexual being. Uh, and in ancient Near Eastern uh, mythology and uh, and other texts, there's there's no problem with other cultures suggesting that the the, the vine has the ability for sexuality. But in this case, uh, the Lord is not. Now, if you were referring to progeny, there may be because, of course, Exodus four twenty two, the Lord says, you know, Israel is my firstborn son, right? So the Lord has progeny. Israel is his firstborn son in Exodus 4.22. Uh, and of course, that's where Jacob Milgram would go with it. So, you know, you see that there. But nevertheless, a sexual knowledge, a greater metaphor for the act of sex, how would that be divine knowledge and that stuff? So anyways, the first parameter, divine knowledge. So the second parameter to which any interpretation needs to hold in my uh, methodology and argumentation to be uh, considered one of the... Um, uh, best interpretations would be number two. And this is the one that I suggest is a lacuna, i.e. A, a big gap and hole within the uh, history of research. And that is that the interpretation must explain how tovera, good and bad slash evil, uh, functions in relation to the divine character, in this, in this case, to the Lord, right, in the narrative. Uh, so, in other words, if the Lord has this divine knowledge of Adat Tovera, then why don't we look at how good and evil Tovera functions in relation to the divine character? So, mm -hmm. this, when I say in my title, a theocentric interpretation, that's what I mean. I mean, I'm going to look at good and evil in relation to the divine character first, since it is divine knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. That is practically missing in the history of research. It's uh, It was... An interesting lacuna, it goes back to my reading of 2 Samuel devotionally in that moment, thinking, okay, good and evil is functioning in relation to uh, to the Lord in this in this book, and in the David story, might it say something about the knowledge of good and evil? And it was amazing to me that, that nobody was falling on that. And um, so that is really the contribution that I give uh, in my work mm -hmm. is I – painstakingly go through so many texts to just make the point uh, throughout mm. uh, throughout the book. And number three, of course, any interpretation must demonstrate how the knowledge is reasonably forbidden by the Lord on pain of death in the narrative. So remember, in Genesis 2.16, the Lord says, you can eat from any tree. Any tree that you want to mm -hmm. eat from, you may eat from it, including, it seems, the tree of life. Lest, of course, the trees are just one tree, the tree of the knowledge tree of life. But that's another story. Scholars like to get into that. But it's clear to me there are two different trees in the narrative. Um, and why it's forbidden on pain of death. So, for example, if it is wisdom, i.e. wisdom to live rightly and to, to live correctly, um, why is it forbidden on pain of death? So mm. you, you or, or let's say moral discernment or moral discrimination. So you can... Um, deci decide wisely between what is good and what is evil, but because you have that, uh, we're going to put you to death. So, to me, it doesn't make sense. It needs to be reasonably forbidden on pain of death within the narrative. Now, sexual knowledge works. It's clear in Scripture. Certain sexual acts do merit the death penalty at later points. So, uh, that that does make sense. So, Anyways, those three parameters I sort of I set out in the book, and uh, I have a nice little uh, diagram in which I'll put mm -hmm. the different interpretations to show how I see that they either do or do not fit within those parameters. And in my estimation in the history of research, uh, 
there aren't any that really do fit fully within each parameter. Yeah, and look, I'll, I'll have your book linked into the description of this video oh, as well. Yes, but yes, because you can see it in the Google preview, actually. So Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, so just to summarize those three parameters, number one, um, the interpretation of the knowledge of good and evil must show that it's a divine knowledge. Number two, um, that it must show how this can be said of God. Um, yes, how how is it that good and evil function in relation to the divine character function. within the within okay. the biblical text, especially? Mm -hmm. So within the Eden narrative, within the early chapters of Genesis, and then even more broadly within the Deuteronomist Deuteronomistic history uh, and out from there, even so. Cool. And then three, how um, div this divine knowledge is reasonably forbidden on on pain of death. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. So what you do then is is you then run that through, as you say, um, I guess the Hebrew Old Testament, and you have to be selective, PhD, you know, deep and right. narrow, not broad and shallow. Um, <laughs> and I guess what I appreciated as I as I looked at this in your work is the concern, f your concern for the use of of words in the biblical historical context. I mean, yeah, you know, the ancient uh, in the ancient Greco culture, an idiot was a private person. Well, it's not quite the idea of an idiot today. So um, <laughs> etymology is helpful and it takes us so far, but it's really mm -hmm. the way that these words are used in their grammatical mm -hmm. historical context. Yeah. And, um, you know, on the historical side, you spend a lot of time mining some of these extant writings yeah. from the ancient Near right. East. And yeah. I understand there is a lot of symbolism tied to the ancient Near East and cultural views of trees. So a uh, quick question here, how did you control against endless rabbit trailing of symbolic <laughs> speculation here and not end up with some allegorical thing yeah. <laughs> that was just, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. well yeah. beyond the scope of scripture? <laughs> well, my supervisor helped with that tremendously, right? Professor Tia Meyer, mm -hmm. she did a great job of telling me to stay on track. But um I would say the, you know, interestingly, um, that, I mean, if someone were to make an argument against me in any way, I, I sort of leave ets out of it. I don't really bring ets into the interpretation. There's just a swath of of, of studies out there on, on trees. And mm -hmm. to me, it was more about the da'at itself. Uh, the knowledge of good and evil, especially good and evil, you know, Hada'at is important, but even there, there's a lot of studies on Hada'at that, that I didn't even feel the need to go deeply into Hada'at either, uh, but to really focus on, on Tove Ra and good and evil. So that's how I tried to stay out of it. The Eden narrative is hard. There's so much, there's so much that you want to, you want to talk about because it's such an interesting and, 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 uh, formative narrative. Um, but it, I just early on, uh, I was I was advised stick to exactly what you are looking at and try not to, as you say, get into the weeds or or follow mm -hmm. the rabbit trails too far. So, uh, but there are oh, some, rabbit trails, there are some <laughs> rabbit trails I indeed did follow that never made it uh, never made it into the, the published version for sure. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So, okay. Applying this threefold approach then, and, you know, appreciating that your work is hundreds of pages and that's to say nothing of the notes that you collected along the way. Um, could you give us one or two of your main findings from yeah. your research as you ran this um, threefold approach through the, the Hebrew Old Testament? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, the first thing I would say is that uh, the motif of uh, of seeing the eyes opened of the humans when they eat of the tree, uh, obviously, is a motif that many would just suggest is a receiving of uh, of a knowledge or a wisdom. Their eyes were open to something new. That's mm -hmm. that's sort of how the interpreters go with it. But I again, if we put the theocentric analysis on it, isn't it interesting that as the eyes are opened? Uh, to a knowledge of good and evil, we can easily point towards other eyes in the narrative that often are looking at good and evil, which are the mm -hmm. eyes of the Lord himself, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I thought that was just a nice parallel that, that really, again, it was hard to find anywhere in the history of research. Um, but to me, that is one of the most significant findings, and that is that often in the biblical narrative we will see that the eyes of the Lord will judge something as good or as bad and evil. Really, it uses two roots. A lot of times, tov, but more often, yashar, which is a meaning straight or correct or right. Uh, 
Um, it's another route. But but often when something is is bad or not in accordance with God's will, uh, Ra is the word that is used. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, Ra, it could mean bad. It could mean evil, moral evil as we understand it. Um, it could also mean, in this case, not in accordance with uh, the divine will. I think that's a, that's a big part of it. Uh, and then, he, this is the most interesting part in my uh, argument, is that it could also mean just bad or misfortune. So, if, um, for example, if, um, let's say, a, uh, well, we'll take the deluge, for example. So, the, the flood happens. That could be described in the narrative as a great ra'ah, a great disaster. Uh, it's the same root in Hebrew. It's a different, it's a permutation of that root, um, and uh, and that's what it means. So it doesn't mean moral evil in that case, doesn't mean uh, anything but something bad, right? Something terrible, a misfortune, a disaster that has taken place, a ra'ah, but the same root nonetheless uh, in the narrative. So what we often have in these narratives, the eyes of, of the Lord judging something as good or bad, and then a consequent act of the Lord that brings forth something in the text that is also described as a tov or a ra'a or an evil in that mm-hmm. sense. So the classic example in the David story, going back to Second Samuel, is, of course, David says uh, to Joab, his commander, after he has Uriah murdered uh, uh, in the battle against the Ammonites, um, he tells Joab, don't let this thing be evil in your eyes. And then about two verses later, we read, but the thing that David did was Ra, right? It was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And once you get into the second, uh, into chapter 12, Nathan the prophet shows up and he says, Behold, speaking on behalf of the Lord, I'm going to bring Ra upon mm-hmm. you, David. Ra mi batecha. I'm going to bring Ra from your own household upon you, basically for what you did. So what we see is, one, the eyes of the Lord seeing something as tov or ra, and then bringing forth something, uh, the Lord then brings forth something uh, as a good or a bad, depending on whether or not it was tov or ra in that sense, right? So what is this? Mm-hmm. Well, to me, it's the whole process of retribution then, right? You see that we have not just discrimination morally. Mm-hmm. Um, we, have, um, we have also the consequent result that comes forth a reward or a punishment, or in this case, I would say a blessing or a curse, because it's coming from, because it's coming from a divine realm, it has to be a blessing or a curse, right? So mm-hmm. in this case, the Ra'ah functions as the Lord's curse. That Then if you read the David story, and if you follow Ra'ah throughout the whole story, you see that the Lord's curse is working itself throughout the whole narrative and throughout mm-hmm. the whole story. So that uh, mm-hmm. is really the, the most significant finding I would suggest uh, in my argument and uh, in what I try to say with the knowledge of good and evil. Well, let's look at Tovera and how it functions in relation to the eyes of the Lord, and that seems to be how it functions. So, so okay, so I guess discrimination in, in the sense of um, knowledge or awareness, uh, so yeah. not discrimination in like a pejorative sense of the term that we might have no. today. No, 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 no. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, okay, definitely and, not. And that language is coming right from the commentaries from a different era and a different time, so probably sure. should be different. But to discriminate in the sense of to be able to divide, to be able to see differences, this sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that would be one. And then um, yeah. bringing forth so, as a result of what is observed or acknowledged or discriminated. Yes, yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, – so on top of that, then I would then ask the second question. I do this in the in the book. The next chapter beyond that would be okay. If that's the case in relation to the Lord, let's look at it in relation to the humans. Does the same mm-hmm. thing happen with Tovera? And I argue it does. We see it in the David in the Saul narrative. David and Naval. We see it as well, where Tovera is going back and forth, even to the point that Saul will say, "I have done evil to you, David, but you have returned." good to me, right? So there mm-hmm. is this uh, sort of reciprocal thing that's happening between the humans uh, with good and bad as well. That if you do good, you you get good back. If you do evil, mm-hmm. evil comes towards you. Uh, and then, of course, also interestingly, the covenantal aspect that within the covenants of the ancient Near East, uh, 
there is this idea of good and bad relations. And mm -hmm. if you're in line with the covenant, you're in good relationship with the uh, one with whom you are in covenant, either the overlord mm -hmm. or the Saren. Um And in in the language, uh, in the Safiri treaties, the Aramaic Safiri treaties of the, uh, of the 8th century, mm -hmm. we have something very similar here with uh, the words that mean Tov and Ra in Aramaic going back and forth, mm -hmm. um, almost to the point that it seems possibly that what's being said is that uh, I will I will I will lay down the evil if mm -hmm. you don't conform to what the covenant demanded right so mm -hmm. sort of this going back and forth of tov and raw in that particular sense which again is back to being able to um, divide what is good and bad in one's eyes and then bringing forth a consequent reward or punishment that is described in these texts as a good or a Bad, and I would say then the third thing on that, so those you know that sort of works there is number three, uh, the hermeneutical principle of divine retribution, and uh, this is known by scholars, especially Daniel Bode, has done wonderful work at the University of Paris on this, and um, uh, this hermeneutical principle is the structuring element of historiography in the ancient Near East. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. It means that history in the ancient Near East is being written in accordance with a principle of interpreting events that happen. So whether they are good or bad will determine how you write the history. And uh, that good or bad is coming from the divine realm, right? Hermeneutical principle of divine retribution. Now, the interesting thing is, and this is this was something that I stumbled upon about a year and a half into my research, and it sort of unlocked a lot of uh, a lot of this study that I, I didn't realize before, and that is that, um, well, obviously the biblical narratives are structured according to this principle as well. So, mm -hmm. so for example, if you're going to tell the story about how Solomon comes to the throne, how it is that the, the son of the union between David and the wife of Uriah, how is it that that son is the next king of Israel? Well, you tell the story according to the hermeneutical principle of divine retribution, right? So the author is taking us through divine retribution in the story and showing how that retribution leads to Shlomo, to Solomon, becoming the next king of Israel. Um, you could do it the Eden narrative. The Eden narrative is structured according to the hermeneutical principle of divine retribution, right? So the command is given. Uh, the humans disobey the command. And by the end of the narrative, they are cast out of the garden, right? Curses come down, and they're cast out of the garden. So you can see the structure, judges, the whole Deuteronomistic history looks back to Deuteronomy to say, ah, this great ra'ah, this great evil has come upon us in the exile because we did not keep Deuteronomy, right? Or we did not do what the covenant demanded of us. So, um, so anyways, those are probably the three most significant findings that's really at the very heart of my research and my argument uh, for for interpreting Hadat Tove Ra. This is so fascinating to me, and thanks to you, I cannot. I just see it everywhere. <laughs> so um, I I recently you, spoke. Well, um, and not to yeah. interrupt you, but you were one yeah. who has written on this already. So you've already. Uh, I mean, I mean, but you sort had, of. You I've were, tried to. <laughs> but but you came to the table with the question already, right? You said, "I I want yeah, to look into yeah. this too." So it's it's great to be able to hear your perspective back on this for that very reason. So well, so I mean, following your um, uh, following your reading of your work, I recently spoke, uh, took on the challenge of speaking on Judges chapter nineteen, um, and to do that well, I really had to uh, appreciate the whole flow of, of Judges. And having read your work. I was seeing this, all the three elements here of discrimination, retribution, and then the interpretive principle of basically yeah. the rise and the fall of the gods in history. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was seeing that all through the book of Judges. And so, you know, the, the different ways that Judges has been sectioned 1 to 16 from yeah. a narrative point of view. And every that repeated phrase in 1 to 16, it was evil in the eyes of the Lord what the people right. of Israel were doing at that time. But then you yeah. get to the second kind of appendix end of 17 to 21 and the repeated phrase is everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so from the top down, it was evil in the eyes of the Lord. The bottom up, it yeah. was right in their own eyes. And it's not just yeah. that what people were doing was evil. It's that what they were doing, uh, they were calling good what the Lord would call called evil. And to me, that was just feeding yeah. right into this yeah. um, 
spawn of taking and eating in Genesis chapter three <laughs> of the knowledge of good and evil. It's just right yeah. there. And yeah. as you say, you run that through the succession narrative of David, it's all there. Um, and you can start to see some of the theological principles of this, certainly when we get to the New Testament in um, in Romans, as Paul unpacks some of the um, yeah. anatomy of sin and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. No, you do. You're right. And once you unlock it, you can't, uh, you can't unsee it, right? It's like your eyes exactly. are open. There it is. I see it everywhere yeah. now. It's, it's there. Eyes and, are opened. Uh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and it, I think it speaks to the brilliance of the ancient author of the Eden narrative that uh, this term is put there, this motif. And if you can just mm. unlock it, it suddenly speaks to the rest of uh, the rest of Scripture in a way that's it's really brilliant and really fascinating. So, uh, props yeah. to the ancient author on this one. So, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. And and again, it goes back to that idea of we sometimes read uh, a surface level view of this and we think it's just nonsense talking snakes and all the rest. But right. when you slow down, you see that there is such substance to this. Um, yeah. And if for no other reason other than the fact that it's a, a very old text from a very different time and place to our right. own, we need to slow down a little bit and be a bit more careful and not yeah. so, um, you know, presumptuous. Just to back up a little bit on this, I guess, sure. the second point that you found in your work, the yeah. this idea of uh, divine retribution or bringing forth something called good and evil. Yeah. Um, in your work, you also identify that in, t in the language of blessing and cursing. Correct. To clarify from, I guess, a... Um, uh, a more apologetic angle. Um, yeah. There are many challenging passages in the Old Testament about God's judgment, many that I think all of us, if we're honest, find difficult to read and, and to process right. in yeah. terms of our understanding of God's administration of justice. Yeah. Um, what would your findings have to say about that? And also to clarify, you, you did touch on this very briefly when you said it's not necessarily bringing forth moral um, evil, good right. or bad or evil, yeah. um, but it is is a bringing forth in some sense how do, like you're not connecting god as the cause of evil in this are you so could you just clarify i guess from whatever that question is i've just put towards you um <laughs> how would you make sense of some of these yeah. you know challenging texts in the old testament about god's administration of justice mm -hmm. yeah so I, I think that it, it is interesting that Ra'a is the root, that or the, the permutation of the root that is used uh, to describe the disaster, the misfortune that is to come mm -hmm. upon others, and God is doing it. Now, the, the text is not suggesting that God is doing moral evil, like what you're saying. The text would be perfectly fine to say that if it wanted to say that. I, I don't have any... Uh, doubt that the ancient authors were perfectly happy going there and saying that. In fact, you get close with some of the prophets uh, who who will challenge God on his justice and say, how how can you use these wicked mm -hmm. people to punish your, your you know your your people? How how can you do that? And um, and so you you do have uh, some of that within Scripture, but never to the point of describing these occurrences as. A ra ah. You even have Job who says, should we not, we receive the good, should we not receive the the bad, the ra, right? So it is it is there too, the evil. And what Job means there is the misfortune that's uh, come upon him. Uh, so, um, yeah, you have that throughout the narrative. I think what I would say to the to our listeners is uh, multifaceted. Uh, I think the first thing I would say is this. Not every occurrence of a bad thing within Scripture is from the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. That is evident. And that was true in other ancient Near Eastern texts as well. So, for example, you have that story in the Philistines where they end up with uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Things are not going so well for them, right? <laughs> and they send it off and they sort of say, well, if what came upon us really was from, from the Lord, right? Right then uh, we'll see the cart go in the direction that it goes, and, uh, and, and this horrible thing that's happened to us will abate, and we'll know that it was the Lord. But if it was by chance. So even mm -hmm. the characters within the narrative are willing to say if it was by chance that such a thing happened, right? So again, it brings it down to the level of interpretation. Uh, what happens to Uriah the Hittite could have been described in the text as divine retribution. A horrible thing happened to him, but instead the text calls out the king who did it to him, the tribal chieftain who did it, did it to him, and uh, and then some horrible things happened to him, and the text is telling us 
that indeed that is divine retribution that has come upon him. Um, so the, the text is perfectly fine um, with the, uh, with with having us to interpret rightly what is and is not divine retribution in one sense. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as God's justice, I, I don't need to be one to uh, defend it. I don't know that it needs defending ultimately mm-hmm. um, uh, by any means. Uh, he is God. He can. I think the way that the Hebrew Bible would understand it, uh, and I think this is the real wisdom of Job, is yeah. that God is uh, is is free to do what He wants uh, when mm-hmm. it comes to good and evil. I think that really is the point of Job. Now, the good news is He's good, right? <laughs> uh, you can you can trust Him in it. But um, I think all humans, every generation, is going to have to just grapple with things that God does. And again. Um, just because God saw that the earth, uh, we'll say this, just because God saw that the, the, the evening and the morning of the first day was good and that the light was good doesn't mean that another judge somewhere is going to see it as good. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so my point with that is that, um, I, you have to grapple with the things in the text that are there. Um, but I don't know that a defense is really uh, needed. And of course, I'm not trying to make that defense by any means. Mm. I'm just asking what is Hadad Tove Ra and how is the text describing it in that sense? Yeah, so, sure. Uh, but this I is think how what the I, what I, Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think what I find so interesting is, um, you know, you, you have a text like Judges 19, which is one of the most horrific yeah. kind of stories in the Old Testament there with the Levite and his concubine. Right. And that whole narrative in 19.1 is prefaced with um, in those days there's no king in the land and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Yeah. In other words, God is not here. There is no king. There is no right. appointed one. Um, and so left to their own vices, devices, um, yeah. this is the result of a humanity trying to play at the administration of justice themselves, doing right. what is right in their own eyes, uh, which right. the Lord, by the way, in chapters 1 through 17 have been saying is evil. Um, yeah. And so... <laughs> I guess the thing that I struck me as I read that is, okay, God isn't there and this is a grim situation. Now, when God is there, there is justice that's handed down. And so the contrast of Judges 19 would be Genesis 19 with Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, And you have the whole exchange with Abraham before that city. Uh, If there's, you know, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10 um, people that are are righteous, will you spare it? And he says, yes, 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 yes. Um, but there weren't, and so justice came, and it severed and ended the um, yeah. the kind of immorality that was going on there. But that doesn't happen in Judges, Judges 19. 19. No, it doesn't. And then um, what does happen is Israel sort of bands together as a result of this concubine, and then they it, it awakens them for a moment, but then they descend into their first civil war, and yeah. on and on and on we go. So <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah. It, 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 it's a great point that you're making because I think it's uh, – it, there's nothing in Judges 19 that suggests that that state of events is caused by divine retribution, right? There's exactly. nothing there exactly. that indicates that in the text. And that's the greater point to be made, that the, the, the authors of these texts are willing to interpret certain events, but not every event as uh as being from god and and that's that's the uh that's the great thing about being the narrator and being the author you have divine knowledge yourself or divine insight Mm -hmm. that others uh don't have uh within the you know within the the logic of the text so um but yeah on that particular note i think it's interesting it's sort of like psalm 82 and psalm 82 uh, El or God, there the 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 chief uh, of of the divine council. He judges the other deities, right? The other gods or the other divine beings or the other heavenly beings, however you interpret it. He judges them in that particular narrative or in that particular psalm for not administering justice rightly in the earth. And this is the real point of Judges 19: is that everybody is doing what's right in their own eyes. Uh, mm-hmm. God's justice, i.e., his uh, his mishpat, his moral will, is not being upheld in ancient Israel. They are like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the point. That if you do what's right in your own eyes as a society, you will end up as as it is in Genesis 19. And even there, mm-hmm. right, like you're saying, God does show up to deal with it and to 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 put an end to, especially the um, the um, sorry, it's getting late here. The uh, 
what I want to say, the uh, the human violence, but but really the um, the innocent bloodshed is what I'm going for. Sorry. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking of Hamas in Genesis six. Innocent yeah. bloodshed there leads to the flood. Innocent bloodshed is really the thing uh, that 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 warrants divine retribution, and and you sort of see that in in some of these narratives. But it seems that as we move in out of Judges nineteen, yes, it devolves into a civil war. But there is sort of this idea that the humans are going to try to bring some justice to the situation. Um, and then, of course, the real divine justice comes, uh, at least in the Christian canon, in the book of Ruth, right? Because mm-hmm. here comes the Moabitess who ends up in Bethlehem, which, if I remember right, is where the concubine was from uh, mm-hmm. in, in the Judges 19 story. So there's a nice little correlate going on there, a parallel going on there between uh, between the two. So. And to to walk through redemptive history to the apex of Golgotha, you know, yeah. I do see as I was reading what you're saying, the implications there in terms of, again, not that you necessarily go here in your, your research, but just the many splintered thoughts that were coming out as I was reading this, the implications for the theories of the atonement. I mean, Galatians 3.13, the idea that Christ redeemed us from the yeah. cursed, from the yeah. bringing forth of Ra uh, by becoming a curse, by becoming a a Ra now. Um, that's, it's, that's, I'm not quoting the Greek there, that's clearly the Hebrew, but, you know, the yeah. concepts are there in terms of becoming a curse and yeah. um, being a cursed. It, it's mm-hmm. all there in the one, and he is the innocent one that that, mm-hmm. that goes through that as well. So. Yeah, well, you're absolutely one. right about that. And I, I haven't written on that. I'd, I'd probably like to, you know, as a, of course, this is just, I'm just a Hebrew Bible scholar trying to answer this question within that particular context. Mm-hmm. And, um, but speaking, I guess, as a, as a Christian and, and trying to do some, some theology around this. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I, uh, I used to follow the, I was raised Roman Catholic and stepped into the Pentecostal world and uh, have been there ever since. But I used to follow some of the uh, the Roman Catholic pilgrims from India as they would do the Via Della Rosa uh, during uh, during my time in Jerusalem. I, I, w- I would mm-hmm. go there and do it every Easter weekend. And uh, I remember the year in which I think I was writing this paper, so I was thinking about the knowledge of good and evil, right? Uh, but the first two stations, obviously the condemnation of Christ – and then the putting of the cross upon Christ, putting the crowns on him and uh, uh, by Pilate and all of that. Uh, I was sort of struck in those in those two first stations. And I remember I didn't make it past that second one. I just sort of sat there and meditated a, a good deal for that day. And I began to think about John's gospel, uh, especially chapter 19. And I thought, how is it that a man, a human, is going to sit here and condemn the Mashiach, the King of Israel, the Messiah himself? Uh, from, from our Christian understanding, the second person of the Trinity, this is God incarnate, he's going to condemn him to death, and uh, and he's able to do that. So it was sort of at that moment that there was a fusing for me of Genesis 3 and the Passion narratives, because mm. I thought to myself, if... If, if the crucifixion is dealing with that first thing that really sent us into this uh, this path, right, uh, the fall itself, then certainly it has something to do with the knowledge of good and evil. It must, right? Mm-hmm. And I think we see it in Pilate. Pilate stands as the mm-hmm. one with Adat Tove Ra, and he speaks, he speaks a judgment which is represented as a curse, and that judgment leads to the crucifixion. Now, Paul in Galatians 3.13 is you know quoting Deuteronomy twenty what is it like twenty one twenty three mm. and that particular um, interpretation I think by Paul is to say look he is cursed by God because he's hanging on a tree and that is very a much a part <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and, yeah exactly yeah. exactly and that is yeah. very much a part of the ancient Near Eastern thought as well in this retribution. Uh, mm-hmm. Piece. I remember George Mendenhall, a great scholar of the Hebrew Bible, though there's no textual evidence of this, he would say of the Hittites and their covenant uh, suzerain vassal treaties that um, mm-hmm. let's say they had a, a, a vassal in the land of Canaan, for example, and if that vassal was not obeying uh, the Hittite king or the overlord uh, or, or being faithful to him, that king could, in theory, according to the covenant, bring forth a military apparatus to punish that uh, vassal, uh, 
And that would be interpreted as the materialization of the divine curse, according to the Hittite understanding of the blessings and the curses. So you see here, uh, there is a, a fusing of human and divine retribution that's happening there. Mm -hmm. You see this in the Hebrew Bible at multiple points. And I think you see it right there in John's gospel in John chapter 19, where the human declares his judgment but it is, in fact, God's materialization. It's the materialization of the curse of the Lord laid upon the Son. And um, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing when you when you study this deeply. And out of that comes the greatest tov ever, right? You couldn't have imagined this mm. tov that was going to come out of this, the forgiveness of sins, followed by the resurrection of the dead. Uh, you couldn't make it up if you wanted to, right? It's, it's mm. the greatest tov that is offered to humanity. And, uh, and it's all through God's retribution, right, is doing of tov and of raw in that sense of blessing and cursing. And Paul, I think even there in Galatians goes on, right, that the blessing of Abraham, right, that the blessing of Abraham might come mm -hmm. upon the Gentiles, mm -hmm. that they might receive the spirit then in that sense. So, so yeah, there's, which there's is, of course, going back to genesis 12 1 to 3 the blessings and curses that god promises exactly. through abraham yeah yeah, yeah. yeah exactly mm -hmm. and uh, there, there's a lot there yeah but yeah he says to the he says to abraham i will bless those who bless you and i will curse those who curse you right so mm -hmm. same language yeah, yeah. fascinating yeah <laughs> um yeah so okay so that's a lot um it is we, yeah. could you just maybe sum that up again in brief sure um what yeah. is the knowledge of good and yeah. evil yeah, so I am suggesting then that Hadat Tove Ra is divine wisdom for administering retribution. Tove Ra understood as reward and punishment, kind of blessing and cursing. Um, and that is the knowledge that is received by the humans that they in fact become judges in the earth and can also bring forth retribution, Tove Ra, good and evil, uh, I'm sorry, good and bad slash evil in the sense of reward and punishment. I am, to be clear, I'm not saying that the knowledge of good and evil is the ability to do good and evil in a moral sense. So, for example, the command is given in the Genesis narrative, and before they eat from the tree, they are already committing that act, right? So they have the ability for freedom and for will to do it. So I'm not suggesting yeah. that that is it. What I'm suggesting is that it is a wisdom for employing uh, sort of a moral order and to sustain that moral order at the same time, i.e. through retribution in the earth. So you can do this at the individual, the familial, the communal. And I think we see it. We see it so clearly sort of at the geopolitical and macro levels on a cosmic level. Mm -hmm. and I think John 19 is a great example where you might see that. So, yeah, uh, sure. um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so the, the problem isn't to go back to that, I guess, misconception of the nature of the tree in the garden that we began with. The problem isn't certainly the tree, nor even the knowledge that is imparted by this tree, but rather the exercise thereof east of Eden in a way that is not exactly. under the administration of God. Yeah. Precisely, precisely. And for whatever reason, and that's very it's good you put that up because Genesis 3.22 is, is quite clear. Before God can even finish his thought, he's already mm. exiling them from the earth because he doesn't want them to, um, to take from the tree of life and live and eat forever yeah. in this state. And it seems that until – it also makes sense to me. Leviticus 19.18 is quite clear, right? Uh, you shall not take vengeance against your neighbor, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus makes mm -hmm. it clear that uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I think you see this reciprocal uh, thing of retribution happening in those sorts of statements. Mm -hmm. And it would make sense to me that if humans are in um, in disobedience to the moral will of of God, at least from the logic of the Eden narrative, that's a problem and can be highly dangerous Hence, my third parameter that uh, the knowledge is reasonably forbidden on pain of death. You cannot take this if you are not going to do what I say type of thing. Yeah, that would be a, a, a good part too, to, to explore the nature of death and, and, and the, you know, the way that that's come about. But we won't go there for now. It's, it's getting late for you. And, <laughs> it's 
Um, deep, I'm yeah. just starting to warm up with my coffee though, so uh, it's an early, <laughs> early issue. Well, you got a lot uh, to look, think just about before the morning, so yeah, I do. I certainly do, and and I think, uh, or oh, I hope that the listeners on reflection of this will just see this everywhere too as they open up their scriptures and read through it. Even look around the world today. I mean, we won't go there now, but just the idea of justice, social justice. I mean, yeah. Nietzsche, Beyond Good and Evil, Foucault, right. um, punishment, and uh, his review of um, of you know, the penal systems, there's just, it's all in the literature. It's it's so much a, a topic about these categories of good and evil. And what you're suggesting here out of the the deep recesses of some of the most ancient texts that we have is mm. this is all bundled up in the nature of creation, the nature of what it is to be human, and uh, ultimately our relationship with God, which I really, really do appreciate. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, yeah. And, and I guess to that point, um, before we wrap up, you know, Scripture, as I understand it, is not just for the download of information. It's it's no. also to do with transformation. And I'd love to hear, uh, I guess, personally from you, how this study has mm-hmm. transformed your personal view of mm-hmm. God and, and how you think it could help others, believers or skeptics alike. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that is a, uh, that yeah, that was, that's a d- difficult question. I think mm-hmm. it's still affecting me in many ways. Um, it was, it's funny, I, it, well, I, I often I had this book, you know, on my on my shelf by Anne Marie Kitts. The title is 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 Cursed Are You, right? A phenomenology of Akkadian <laughs> and Hebrew uh, uh, text, uh, cursing in Akkadian and Hebrew text. And anyways, mm. I, I saw that my whole PhD, and I thought maybe it was the PhD, but uh, but maybe it's more <laughs> than that. But there's there's so much to this to be um, uh, to 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 really bring formation. I think as you dive deep into Scripture, as you've seen, just reading Judges, it really unlocks sort of how the narrative is moving and where it's going ultimately to the greatest good of all when you get to the cross and uh, you have this fusing of divine and human retribution to bring forth the greatest good for humanity possible. Mm -hmm. And um, I I would say this one, one thing that really hit me during this time was divine freedom. I did not really, I mean, I guess I've always thought of God being free, but in this case, I really saw it in a way that uh, I can't unsee it now. God is free to do what He wants as Creator in the in the midst of this discussion of of, of good and bad. And I think that's the great lesson of Job, ultimately, who is suffering because he is so righteous. That's why he's chosen to suffer because he's such a righteous person. Um, it's a flipping of the retribution principle in that particular narrative. Uh, but interestingly, at the end, you know, Job finally sees God and says, I repent in dust and ashes, you know. So this whole story, Job really wants to uh, take him to uh, to court and to say, you're not managing the universe correctly. But by the end, um, just seeing God uh, suggests to Job that I think God is free to do what he wants and mm-hmm. that that Job must worship him in that. And I think this, I, I don't, I don't think that that's, um, I think that's sort of the highest point that wisdom can go. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that we see that with Jesus who submits himself to the cross and to the will of the father in that divine freedom. Number two, he does bless and curse. And this is mm-hmm. an interesting one. There's a lot today in evangelicalism, uh, a lot of theologians who are suggesting that God does not bless and curse, certainly could not curse. God of love could not do that. And um, and I think the Hebrew scriptures are clear on it that no, yes, he does, and that 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 should be part of your theology. Be very careful, I think, with that. Um, I think that sort of goes along with uh, with line number one, and then this one's great. Number three, those two are sort of they put you in a place of awe and uh, mm. and. Uh, reverence and and fear but not in a scared fear but but that definitely has been part of uh my thinking of late and in, in, in reflecting on this but number three he's an ancient spirit now this is the fun thing mm-hmm. i was uh i was reading the adapa myth uh from anywhere between the 14th and 12th centuries uh, bce uh, a story that's similar kind of to the eden narrative it's a uh, uh you know it's about knowledge and it's about life and how it is that humans have uh, wisdom, but uh, but they're forbidden life from the gods, eternal life, and very similar in some respects to the narrative, but also different. And um, I don't know. I mean, like I said, an ex-Roman Catholic turns Pentecostal, baptized Roman Catholic turned <laughs> turn Pentecostal. Um, I had a moment in my research when I was when I was reading that ancient story, and um, it's sort of uh, ancient history is 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 a lot like deep space for me. We see it, we mm. know it, we can observe it. 
but we're never going to get there in our lifetime. Mm-hmm. And, uh, mm-hmm. and the ancient world is a lot like this. It's, it's there. We, we have these texts. These people who are dead are still speaking to us from the past. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think that what, what this study, for me anyways, led me to was that um, God chose these ancient peoples to reveal himself to the world. And mm-hmm. uh, he is that ancient spirit, that spirit of old, right? He is the... The, uh, the ancient of days, if you will. And um, mm. that was really solidified for me in this. I don't, I don't view the ancient past anymore as something way off in the distance. It's near, like I said, we can see it, but, uh, but still somewhat closed off, just like mm. uh, just deep space in that sense. So, yeah. uh, but anyways, those are, those are some things that uh, I'm reflecting on in that. So. Yeah, no, I appreciate that so much. And, you know, for myself, um, it's and ev- even from your work, it is seeing the self-authenticating nature of some of these insights that you've been able to yeah. bring forth um, mm-hmm. in the nature of trying to administer, uh, yeah. observing and trying to administer justice or whatever in my own way, and then seeing how that gets me apart from <laughs> submitting it <laughs> yeah. to the Lord and things like that. You know, well, exactly. um, and so it's right. just it it attests to the, I think the the value add and the truthfulness to some of these old texts because human nature, yeah, we've evolved and progressed and moved forward in time and space, but at our, um, at our Genesis, you know, there's a commonality there. And and I think you've explored that really well in, in some of these deep old texts and truths from the past. So yeah, yeah, look, Nathan, it it has been an absolute pleasure, Uh, truly, truly fascinating conversation. I wish we could talk more, but I appreciate your time. Um, (laughs) So Look, just uh, if people want to explore more about um, mm-hmm. uh, your work and ha- and keep up to date, how can they go about that? Yeah, very good. So uh, you can check out my academia.edu page where I will be posting future research when that when that happens and um, and and other works as well. You can uh, you can look at Hebrew Bible Insights. So check out Hebrew Bible. Uh, insights.com is a podcast uh, that myself and a colleague of mine, uh, Matthew Delaney, here at uh, Oral Roberts University, we are uh, doing this podcast together, Hebrew Bible Insights. We have a lot of uh, interesting things in store for our listeners, but those are two places where uh, you can access uh, me and my work and uh, and our work together with uh, with Matthew Delaney. So. Great. Well, check it out. I'll put a link as well in the description to this video Excellent. below. Nathan, Dr. Nathan French, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs>